Anton, we have some problems with the, the, the file that you uh -huh. sent. Uh, I don't know if you call finish your your okay. presentation. Okay. Uh, yeah, then, uh, I'll, I'll definitely. I'll, maybe I'll just continue talking and. Uh, uh, so yeah, I think I can. Uh, so I can describe the results. Uh, yeah, without the slides. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, good. Okay, so basically the uh, most important finding on eye contact is that um, if you were to look below someone's eyes, people are actually a lot less sensitive than if you were to left to the left, right, or above someone's eyes. And in fact, typically, you're to the left and right and above the number that people, uh, previous study psychologists have found is around one to two degrees. And what we find is when you look below someone's eye, you can actually look down to about seven or eight degrees, and people still cannot tell the difference between you if you're looking at them or you're looking at, if you're looking to the eyes or not. And you know, one reason for um, this, yeah, it turned out the reason for uh, this asymmetry in sensitivity is that it has to do with the anatomy of our eyes. That we don't we do not have muscle to control our lower eyelids, but we do for upper eyelids. This one, if we were to look up, our lower eyelids stay still, versus if we were to look down, our, both our eyelid tracks are like uh, eyes together, and this is why looking down so much differently. Um, I can send you the slide at a later time, and this is one of the where if you just see the pictures, then it just become obvious why um, it's so different. Now. Um, then we also compare the difference between people in a conversation or people looking at recorded video. We basically, we found that people's a lot more, a uh, lot less sensitive. Uh, okay, see slides coming up. I don't see slides anymore. Okay. Uh, and basically. Um, yes, we could advance. Yes, advance a few more. More, uh, more. The next one, please. And next one, please. Okay, yes. Uh, okay. Um, so what we found is uh, <coughs> that if we to compare when someone look, so what this graph shows you on the horizontal axis is show you. If per the person were looking right into the camera at zero degrees, all the way down to about 15 degrees below oh. someone's, like, okay. below the camera with someone's eyes, and the vertical axis shows a percentage of times that people actually perceive that gaze direction as looking into the eyes. Notice that when someone look uh, or in a conversation rather than watch, watching uh, expressionless faces, more people perceive eye contact. Go ahead, the next slide, please. Um, then the finally, the final study we do is, co is compare the difference between if we're looking at judging eye, con uh, eye contact in a video conference environment versus in a face-to-face -face environment. This study gave us indication uh, as if we were to use eventually better than TV quality video conferencing system, for example, using HDTV or even more than HDTV resolution, how will our finding be changed. So we use face-to-face uh, -face as one measure of a possible reasonable upper bound on um, uh, what the uh, video conference resolution will achieve. And notice that even in this curve, that, uh, uh, the curve did not drop down uh, around 1 to 2 degrees as a classic psychology would have predicted, but versus it was dropping down maybe around 5 to 6 degrees. Can I have the next slide, please? So finally, one way to summarize this result is, so the classic uh, psychologists have found that in the best case, we could judge eye contact very accurately, what they call it the Snell and acuity, acuity. It's as good as our ability to read a text and fine print, the same thing as you would go to a doctor's, eye doctor's exam office to get an exam on your vision. And what we found that if we were to compare that of someone looking sideways or up versus when someone looking down, that the people become less sensitive. Uh, then if you compare it when someone looking down versus looking down, and in the video, again, people become less sensitive to eye contact. Basically, they perceive more eye contact from the same visual angle. And finally, if they were also so is that 
because um, we can leverage all these three conditions to actually achieve eye contact in a video conferencing. But we do not, if we were to try to build a video conferencing system, we do not need to try to hit a snail on acuity. All we need to do is try to hit the conference acuity, which is roughly around 7 to 8 degrees. Based on this set of finding, we also, um, this graph also implies that we're biologically biased to perceive eye contact, meaning that every time the uh, signal to noise ratio are uh, decrease, our sensitivity also decreases and more people perceive eye contact. And this model is different from the classic psychology model. They say that roughly, you know, where there's no bias in the way we perceive eye contact. Can I have the next slide, please? So finally, what is the, uh, the question you put about, how does this impact the way we uh, uh, the way we do video counseling, and more specifically, how does it impact the way video counseling are designed? Well, if you were to look, assume a sensitivity around 7 degrees, and if you have a palm held device, assuming minimal of viewing distance about 1 foot, that the camera to render eyes, it has to be about 1.5 inches, and this is actually very trivial to achieve. So this implies that if you were to have a cell phone or PDA or a small, very small laptop, that uh, eye contact will not be a problem. But the interesting case is, what about desktop system? Uh, assuming a minimum viewing distance on two foot, that means the camera to render eyes distance about three inches. So we built a prototype with which a diagram on the picture. Uh, basically, we just took off the uh, camera, about $80 USB camera off the shelf, which is made a special mount. So we found that if you frame the image such like that, you just barely hit the 70 degree angle, and most people perceive eye contact. And finally, if you were to have a wall size display, assuming a full viewing distance, then the camera to render eyes distance has to be around 12 inches. But this is not difficult to achieve. Can I have the next slide, please? So in conclusion, we found that most people believe that if you want to high, have high fidelity uh, audio video, you must buy a very expensive dedicated hardware. What we claim is that you can achieve even higher quality on the PC. And this is exactly the demo that Intel president uh, demonstrated in his keynote address about, uh, about three weeks ago. And then most people also believe that video conferencing system has to be very difficult to install and use, getting the audio set up correctly, figure out which cable to plug in. We believe that you can achieve this using a simple one-click operation, leveraging a lot of the web distribution technology. And in terms of human factor, most people believe that life-size displays are ideal. What we find is there's a range of angles that people are able to tolerate for projected base, a projected uh, uh, video conferencing system. And it's about 6 to 14 degrees. And because people do not like to move their heads when they see a large group of people, see, actually a lot of times when you have display, everything in a life-size is actually not ideal. And in terms of floor control, most people believe that you need at least 10 frames a second. This is what most commercial systems like Polycoms attempt to achieve. And, but we found that for, for the case of, of small group discussions, assuming if you can transmit frames dynamically using computer vision algorithms to detect those gestures, you could decrease average frame rate to about 0.2 frames per second. And finally, that most people believe that eye contact is difficult. For example, the video conferencing system we're using today, it's really not possible to achieve eye contact. But what we find, this is based on a classic psychology finding to say that you, know, you could look at most one to two degrees away from someone's eyes and tell people can notice this. But we find that, in fact, you could look about seven degrees in the down direction and people can still not tell the difference. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so finally, I would like to go, uh, so a set of findings based on that, what we, it's a, it's a larger picture, a bigger conclusion to say that really, you know, take the PC, take your laptop, you really have a high fidelity, low latency, multi-party video conferences on your desktop. And if you look at the trends in terms of computing increase, in terms of network speed increase, in terms of how uh, the, these inexpensive USB or firewire based cameras, it's like all the components are there and they're all, in fact, they're all very cheap. In fact, if you were to want to build the highest quality video counseling system, you will base them on a PC-based system rather than go on and spend $10,000 by a polycom system. And finally,
finally, based on this sort of conclusion, we, I would like to claim that we're at the dawn of video conferencing resolution. For example, I believe there is a need for, you know, there is a lot of demand for doing this sort of remote collaboration, distance learning type of stuff, you know. But, but until recently, doing this is just, is, it's such a headache, right? They're setting up the system or just, it's so much headache. But all these components are coming together that we actually can find them to achieve this. So can I have the next slides, please? So I would like to acknowledge my advisor, Professor Pat Hanrahan, Terry Winograd, and also, of course, the agency that funded my research for the past years, past number of years. These are Intel, Sony, Interval Research, the uh, Swedish Wallenberg Global Learning Network, and the United States Department of Defense. And finally, I would love to hear from you. The URL below is the URL for the project website. We have papers on there and also the link on how you can use the system. One thing I would love to be able to establish is the uh, video conference link between Stanford and University of Mexico. I was down in the we might have given a talk in Brazil about a month ago that we were really happy that we could just go to Brazil, take a normal laptop, and using their existing framework, click, make one click uh, on a button able to see Stanford. And the frame rate was not great. It was about three to four frames per second. It was still high quality video in terms of resolution. And it seems like a lot of these networks are coming up to speed in terms of doing, making these global scale conferencing even possible. So definitely, please, uh, I, I I do apologize for giving talk this way because I'm not able to see you in live, not able to interact with your live. Answer your question is, I feel like I'm not doing, I'm doing a horrible job like this. But definitely email, feel free to email me and we can chat more both through email, telephones, or maybe through video conferencing to, um, see what we can take about, you know, these just PC based, you know, just how to help easy could we make video conferencing. Uh, I, I, this, this concludes the, uh, my talk. Is there any questions or comments? Thank you very much, Anton. Okay. Thank you very much for talking about uh, this new way to make video conference. <laughs> and I hope uh, a lot of people from here will be in contact with you. With you. Okay, I will look forward to it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Mexico. I just have. I just give a talk remotely. To, to, uh, oh, so they were just listening to your talk? Yeah. Just cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. La siguiente plática es la aplicación de telefonía por IP que ofrece Walt Magnussen de Texas A&M, México. Gabriela Medina, que no la veo por aquí. La conferencia es en inglés. ¿Desean oírla en inglés o aquí nos hacen favor de traducirla al español? Por mayoría de votos, me prefiero en inglés. No hay problema.
Um, <clears throat> buenas tardes, and uh, now that I've used up my entire Spanish vocabulary, um, I'll go ahead and continue on with the rest of the presentation. Um, Walt Magnuson from Texas A&M University, and I um, had a chance to talk to many people here from the group uh, about this time last year about voice over IP. <clears throat> so this is a an update of where we sit within the Internet 2 community on what we're calling the voice over IP test bed. <clears throat> how many folks here, how many universities currently um, have voice over IP networks installed within their institutions? Okay. How many people are currently considering putting in voice over IP networks? And it would be my guess that probably most of the people here within the universities are really just doing voice over IP within their universities and are not really connecting the networks to each other, correct? Okay. That's what we're trying to resolve within the um, Internet 2 community. And quite frankly, it's not a very easy thing to do because those of you who are working with voice over IP realize that most of the instruments and most of the tools and most of the systems are very proprietary even though they're built on top of standards. They're built on top of either H323 or they're built on top of SIP. But the problem is that's kind of where the standardization ends. So what we're, what we're looking at doing is saying it's great that we can do it within the university, but how do we connect between universities? And that's kind of where, where most of the discussion will be today. Voice over IP, I'm not going to really you know, go into many reasons why you should do it because, quite frankly, if your Cisco sales rep has been around, you've already heard this story many, many, many times, so I don't really need to repeat that. But if you're looking at voice over IP, there's a number of major decisions that have to be made. Um, H323, as a standard, has been the standard that most voice over IP implementations have chosen to use for several years. What's happening now is that SIP, or the Session Initiated Protocol, is rapidly gaining a whole lot of popularity. So one of the issues we've got, it's, it's almost like 10, 12 years ago, Ethernet or token ring, which way do you go? Obviously, ultimately, Ethernet won out. We may very well see the same situation within Voice over IP. And of course, you don't want to have a large, large token ring network installed when Ethernet is really ultimately where the industry goes. Um, H323 has at least two or three years head start on SIP, but in terms of simplicity and somewhat in flexibility, SIP has some significant advantages, so it's really hard to say um, where to go. Second major question you're going to look at is which vendor do you use? Because again, while they all use underlying standards, they all let layer proprietary applications on top of it. So there is little to no interoperability standard interoperability once you get to the higher levels. And then do you look at doing this for just certain specific applications, in other words, remote campuses, or do you say we're going VoIP entire campus wide? Some of the major changes we've found as we start to deploy it is that you have to really just start to establish some major relationships on campus. Once you start dealing with voice over IP, in the old days it was very easy. We managed the switch, we managed the telephone, we managed the wire we had end-to-end -end control. What happens within VoIP is I've got the call manager on one side, I've got the call, I've got the telephone on the other end, but you've got this data network in between, and I cannot deliver any better service than the underlying data infrastructure can, can provide to me. So in, in other words, the data infrastructure becomes our, becomes our network, becomes our wire. From there, we found that, in essence, as, as many, again, Cisco and everybody else has been telling us, we've found that if you try doing voice over IP without having some systems of quality of service layered on top of your network, it's going to be, it's going to be bad. If you look at kind of what Abilene is doing, they're talking about over-provisioning. We go ahead and use OC192s on the backbone. We find in local area networks that doesn't always do it for you because of the fact that often you can have microbursts which cause drops and cause other issues that are very, very short in duration that over-provisioning cannot take care of. So quality of service becomes a, a, a critical feature. Why is it a critical feature? Because there are certain parameters that voice over IP does not deal well with. If packet loss is more than 1%, it starts to degrade the quality of either the voice or the video. 
You notice from the last session, you saw a lightning bolt pop up on the screen fairly frequently with the Polycom unit. What was happening there is the screen was locking up. In essence, Polycom sets their threshold at 1% packet loss. Now, those of you guys that run networks know that 1% packet loss, in a lot of cases, is a good network. When it comes to voice and video, they've set 1% packet loss as a maximum allowable. So that really means we've got a serious problem there. Jitter, or the variation between delay and pack, or variation and delay between packets, for the most part, in order for the codecs on voice to work well, has to be less than about 30 milliseconds. Again, a lot of our networks are not designed to, to maximize out at 30 milliseconds jitter. Again, we have to really, that's where, again, a quality of service helps us out there. Latency, since most of our networks are now fiber-based, usually 150 milliseconds in latency is not a major problem. Usually we can get most anywhere in the world. We've got one of the major participants on the voice over IP test bed is all of the universities in Australia. So that link is a fiber link from Australia through Hawaii to Washington, and at that point it hits the Abilene network. We don't have any problem even meeting latency requirements on there, and you figure that's going fiber halfway around the world. So if we can make it halfway around the world on fiber, we should not have any problem, unless you start doing some work with satellites also. But even once we get to the edge of the campus, VoIP still has some significant problems when you start looking at what happens on campus. If you look at most of the network problems that we've got, they're not on the backbones, they're not on the Cootie network, they're not on the Abilene network, they're usually once we get past the router that connects to the network. Again, what you really need to do there to make sure that voice over IP will work well is know your data infrastructure, don't try to do video or voice on unreliable networks, and, don't really, and you need to make sure you've got some pretty good testing tools. If any of you want to talk to me about it afterwards, we've got a tool that we have purchased recently um, we found out about it at one of the last Internet 2 meetings. It's called um, Jalam. It's by some developers out of Canada, and it actually specifically tests networks for H323 type parameters. So it'll tell me how much jitter, how much loss, how much latency, and everything else. That way we can actually test a remote connection, and if somebody says, hey, I want to connect to Washington State, I can look at it and I can tell them that yes, it will probably work, or no, probably shouldn't try it because it's not going to meet the parameters. Okay, so again, what we've done is we've got a lot of voice over IP networks working within our campuses, but then the working group a couple of years ago said we would like to connect to each other. So what we did there is the, a number of people volunteered to give up their time and some of their resources to create a test bed, and the test bed creates long distance trunking between various universities. The universities that we currently have working include the University of Indiana, Texas A&M University, Penn State, the University of Virginia. We actually have the entire Australian research network, so we actually have the entire co country or the continent of Australia online. University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, the Federal University in Rio de Janeiro, University of Florida, CES Net in Czechoslovakia, and more recently, the um, National University in Mexico, or the UNAM. Okay, um, I'm not really here to talk about what we've already done, because, you know, that's quite frankly behind us, and that stuff's working pretty well, but what I'd really like to do is to see if we can get other universities interested in participating with the test bed, and actually take it to the next step, which is to actually form a voice over IP working group within Mexico. The, um, currently, to participate, really what we've done is we have set the standardization at the lower levels, which really says that really in order to participate, all you really have to have is a gateway into your, if you've got a campus telephone switch, you just have to have a gateway into your campus telephone switch, and you have to have a gatekeeper. The gatekeeper and the gateways are both defined by the IEEE, I'm sorry, by the, by the ITU, they're part of the H323 standard, so they are industry standard boxes. And in essence, what happens is the gateway does conversion from your telephone switch to the internet. It takes circuit switch calls out of your telephone switch, usually using a PRI, and then converts it to IP-based to internet packets. That gets it from your campus to the CUDI network, and then from the CUDI network to the Abilene network. Beyond that, we also have to have in there a gatekeeper. Gatekeepers can do a number of different things, but one of the things that it does 
is it translates telephone numbers to IP addresses. So for example, at the UNAM, if they want to call Texas A&M University, there's translations in the gatekeeper that say, Walt at 979-845-5588 is mapped to this H323 domain. So what it really does is it does a translation from telephone number to IP address, IP address to telephone number. Currently, we have everybody's equipment working as long as you're running Cisco, okay, which is not good. We have all of the current participants, the whole list you just saw, are all Cisco participants. We want to get past that. We would really like to have some other institutions working that are running other than Cisco equipment. Um, and in essence, we talked to the university in uh, Veracruz yesterday, and I would like to really do some work. There, you're running Avaya, correct? Um, and um, University of Washington is also running Avaya. We have some sites that are Nortel and some sites that are Alcatel, so we'd like to really go ahead and get all, all four, at least, of those platforms up and running. If you are trying to go into the um, voice over IP, um, if you're trying to go into the voice over IP and you currently do not have any product, one of the things that, and I, I don't want to do this to push Cisco product, okay, because I'm not saying they're the best, I'm not saying they're the only, but they have extended a special offer to people that are participating in this project. What they basically have done is put together a starter package and the starter package has got really all of the components that you need to get started. It's got the gateway, it's got the gatekeeper, and I believe the package either includes 25 telephones or 50 telephones. What they've done in that package is they've given a 50% discount on the hardware, and I believe it's about a 90% discount on the software, so it's a pretty good discount. If you're interested in that package, if you go to the Internet2 webpage uh, for UK, it, on the front of the web page, one of the bottom bullets is Cisco Voice over IP special offer. You would actually, what happens is that's a package number that's been pre-approved by Cisco Corporation. You would take that number, that package number, give that to your local Cisco representative, and they, can, they would sell it to you here in Mexico under that package price, um, under that package deal. Okay? It's limited time offer, and it's only, it's only available institutions that really are, are going to participate in the, um, in, in the test bed. So what we've done initially was to go ahead and one of the problems you've got with H323 is that ultimately the way it works does not scale well as far as the internet is concerned. What you really have to do is you have to map these IP addresses into telephone numbers and telephone numbers into IP addresses and those have to be within the tables of the gatekeepers. Well, obviously, scaling-wise, that doesn't really work well because what happens now is every time, for example, let's say the University of Veracruz comes online, what happens then is that address and that set of telephone numbers has to be mapped into Florida and Indiana and everywhere else. And when another university comes online, it has to be mapped everywhere again. We're trying to push the industry to come up with a multicast protocol that will actually advertise those routes comparable to BGP, but currently it doesn't really exist. So, um, so we figure we probably can handle two or three hundred institutions in there and still manage the tables. But above that, it's going to start to fall apart, I believe. It's, it's going to get to be somewhat unmanageable and unwieldy. What we've really done to simplify part of it, though, is we've established a series of root gatekeepers and for example, if let's say this is the gatekeeper at UNAM and this is a gatekeeper at a university in Australia, we've got root gatekeepers almost like the DNS system to where the gatekeeper at UNAM would request the information for the gatekeeper in Australia, which would, would come up here, ask the root gatekeeper in Australia, which would ask the gatekeeper at the university in Australia. So in essence, it's done like the DNS type system and it does reduce or it minimizes the maintenance on it, but it doesn't really eliminate it completely. We've established so far root gatekeepers in North America, Australia. Um, the University in Rio de Janeiro is going to be the root gatekeeper for um, South America. We have a university in Australia handling Australia and most of most of Asia. And in Egon, in Egon's in Mary, you see in 
Norway? Okay. Egon from, I believe it's Norway, um, is, is handling, handling Europe. Okay, again, what happens within the gatekeepers is they map the telephone numbers to the IP addresses, and they use a series of wildcards. For example, if I'm calling Indiana, my gatekeeper prefix is going to look like this. I go to Indiana University Gatekeeper if I'm calling 1317274 dot 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 dot. So anything within that NNX. So it's pretty straightforward. It's not really very, this, this stuff isn't really rocket science. You see here, for example, if I'm calling anywhere in Australia with the AARN network, my zone is AARN network and it's 61. So all I'm really doing there is giving it the whole country code because we set it up to where anywhere in Australia you can call. So you have 61 and then any telephone number in the country. Pretty straightforward. If you want to become part of the test bed, um, send an email to Mike Enyart or Enyart at indiana.edu and what I will do is I will email this presentation probably to, um, to um, either Hans or Gabi from the UNAM and make sure that they get it out uh, to somebody I guess or send it to Cootie. I'll make sure that somebody has a copy of the presentation so it can be distributed. But if you go to um, e email Mike, he'll go ahead and get you started and he'll send you an email. He'll ask the IP domain the telephone numbers you want to advertise, the type of PBX and gateway that you have. And then from there, what we will do is we will help you to configure, we'll give you configuration information on your PBX, on your gateways, to the best of our ability. And our guys will sit that down and work through the problems with you and getting the network up and going. Quite frankly, right now, if it's Cisco, we can usually have it up and going in two to three hours. If it's anything else, it's going to be a little bit more complex for the first one, once we figure it out, it will be a lot easier after that, okay? So, you know, but our guys are there available and ready to help you on it. If you're interested in doing it, want to know what it costs approximately, for the most part, the packages run about $30,000, but that also gets you some IP telephones. And again, if you're running a Nortel PBX or an Avaya PBX, what, ha what they do, instead of having all of these separate boxes out there, is they put voice over IP gateway cards inside their switches. So in that case, you generally can get started for less money than it would be with going with the native Cisco tech implementation. So depending upon what's best for you, a lot of vendors have got good, good solutions. If you've got nothing that supports voice over IP, Cisco may be one of the better ways to go. But if you've already got a lot of Nortel or you've already got a lot of Avaya, they've also got real good solutions. As I said earlier, H323 pretty much is the way that most of the industry has gone so far, but SIP is really making some serious inroads. And again, SIP stands for Session Initiated Protocol. It's a completely different set of pro protocols than H323. There are only one or two companies currently that are building SIP PBXs. And SIP, SIP is great in that it's very, very simple. It's designed to be peer-to-peer. -peer. In essence, what they did is they modified email headers and they put voice inside the text of the email. So if you look at SIP packets, it looks just like an email packet. Instead of sending to a telephone number, I go to a URL. So they used SMTP and they used HTTP to really simplify the process quite a bit. SIP is very simple to configure, very simple to run, but again, not many vendors are doing it. We are also setting up as of, as of the day before yesterday, we're setting up a SIP trial also that will, looks like as of right now, will probably incorporate four or five universities, um, MIT and again a and Boston University, and anybody that's interested in working with SIP. So if you're interested in going that direction more than H323, let us know and we'll, we'll help you out there too. One of the reasons that it's looking like SIP is going to be very popular is about next July, Microsoft is releasing their next version of XP, um, and the XP version that they're releasing has some very, very significant SIP tools built into it. In fact, they're making SIP a standard part of the operating system. What that means is that our 47,000 students on campus may very well be coming to campus one of these days with voice over IP devices built into the computers that they buy. That gets to be a little bit scary, but I mean, that could be the direction that things could be going. 
Some other initiatives, and I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. We've put together, uh, there's a desire to actually create an audio conference service that uses better than public switch telephone company network services. For example, like this last conference, most telephone calls use relatively narrow bandwidth. They only use 3 kilohertz. There's been some desire to use codecs that run 6 or 7 kilohertz, so the audio sounds much more stereo-like. It sounds much better, but it uses up a little bit more bandwidth. We've been working with a couple vendors on that. We've been working on some other testing tools, including trying to measure how much VoIP is out there on the Appling network. You'll see that when you start dealing with voice over IP, voice over IP is very difficult to measure because it doesn't use one individual port. It uses, in Cisco's case, it uses a range of ports that's almost from one end of the spectrum to the other. So when you try measuring it, it's very difficult. We also, like the IPv6, have been IPv6 workshop or group, have been trying to push workshops. We had one at A&M earlier this year, and there were some people from Mexico with that one. Um, Joint Techs, well, we had another four-hour workshop there. There will be another one in Indiana, and we've also established a test lab at at A&M, and I'll show you that in just a second. The other initiatives we're working on right now involve collaboration with the video working group. One of the problems you've got right now is we got the video net that's doing the same basic thing with gatekeepers for video that we're doing for voice. So a lot of universities are registering their video gatekeepers on one side, their voice, voice gatekeepers on the other side, and we want to try to get it set up to where one set of gatekeepers will do everything for you. Those meetings are going, are, are underway. And Cisco also had brought up, not Cisco, Microsoft had brought up the idea of wouldn't the universities possibly be interested in establishing some enterprise-based um, internet messaging servers that in essence I would register with the university instead of registering with MSN Net or AOL. And we're, we've got some work going on with that too, so I think we'll probably see some IM trials going on here relatively soon. One of the biggest issues we've got is trying to deal with international calling policy. A number of the countries have said, if I'm in Brazil, I'd love to be able to call Texas A&M University, but more than that, I'd love to be able to call all of Texas. The problem is when we do that, it puts us in the status of being a telephone company. And Telmex in Mexico and Quest in the United States have done a lot towards contributing to the backbone of the network. And Abilene appropriate use policy does not allow that to happen, and I imagine Cootie's AUP probably also doesn't. So we've got to be real careful where we end up going with that. Politically, it would not be good, and operationally, I'm not really sure we want to get into the telephone business. The test lab that we've got set up, again, this is just more information for your behalf, but if anybody's ever interested in looking at interoperability, you can come to Texas A&M University. Up there, we're running Alcatel, Nortel, 3Com, Cisco. We also now have Shoreline, um, Pingtel. So we've got about eight different vendors, and all of these vendors are currently interoperating with each other in, in the Voice over IP lab. Again, like I said, the lab, lab is starting to push very heavily into SIP, and one of the other things we just added was an H323 device that is an H3, it's an H323 telephone, but it is a wireless 802.11b telephone. So what I have is a telephone that looks an awful lot like this guy here, but it has an 802.11b interface on it. So as I'm walking around campus, it connects to my wireless AP. And my wireless AP then links it to the call manager, and the call manager then gives it a, a, a telephone number. It is It uses Cisco's proprietary system. Um, actually, Avaya has a comparable unit, so does Nortel. But now they're, what they're starting to do is build wireless telephones that use the existing 802.11b infrastructure. This is the uh, last slide here. And um, what we're doing here, this is a diagram of what the UNAM has on their network. And again, what, what you've got there is in the UNAM, their PBX is connected to the UNAM network, which is connected to CUDI. And from campus, any one of my users, we've got 32,000 telephones on campus. Any telephone can dial star 3, and that brings them over to the voice over IP gateway. Once they dial star 3, I can dial 525 in UNAM, any number at UNAM, and I can get the call there. What we currently are doing is if a faculty member dials 9 and goes out in the telephone company network, they pay for the phone call. 
if they dial star 3 and go out over internet 2, we give them that call for free. So um, you do have the ability to differentiate on that. That's a, that's a campus by campus policy, okay? You can do whatever you want on your campus. We just did that because we're trying to get the traffic going a little bit right now. The challenge here, and actually Alejandro Passanti asked me to go ahead and challenge you guys with this, is we have currently one university going in Mexico. The next meeting is, when's the, when's the spring meeting for Cootie? Sometime in April, okay. By April, we'd like to have an additional four universities in Mexico up and going, if at all possible. So uh, if anybody is interested in doing it, please let us know. We will provide whatever help and support we can to make this actually happen. Again, it's not that difficult. Once you've gone through it once, we'd be happy to work with you on it. And we'd like to see that list of connected universities get larger and larger to where the size of that list is the size of the um, is the size of the um, Internet 2 and the CUDI list. Any questions? Yes, sir. That, that's an excellent question, and I, I don't think, the question was, will we actually have that ability over Internet 1? Personally, I don't think so, and that's the reason that I think things like Abilene and Cootie are going to stay there, because of the fact that it's very difficult to set up QoS policies when you have complete control of the domain. If you actually, if, if, if you are connected to Telmex and I'm connected to Quest, if I buy services from Quest and Quest gives me quality of service on their network and they give me a service level agreement that guarantees delivery, that's only good while it's in the Quest network. As soon as they hand it off to Telmex, it's very, very difficult to negotiate the QoS provisions from one carrier to another. That interoperability may end up happening. It may not ever end up happening. That's the reason that I think you're going to see things like the Abilene network probably stay on forever because just like in the U.S., you have the U.S. Postal Service, and if I don't care if it gets there tomorrow or next week, I put 32 cents on it and I send it that way. But if it's critical, I send it FedEx. In essence, we kind of have the same thing now between the commodity internet and the internet too. But that's just my own personal guess. Yes. We're not bypassing. We are we are not bypassing because of the. I mean, we we've discussed this with Quest. We've discussed this with a um, number of the other carriers. As long as we are talking institution to institution. If I'm only calling from campus to campus, student to student, or faculty to faculty, it's not bypass. If I call the UNAM and if I can dial from the campus, UNAM campus, to get anywhere in Mexico City, then I'm bypassing. And that's what I'm saying we need to stay away from. Uh, do you agree with that or is that? Yes. We basically look at we look at voice over IP as an application, okay? Carlos. What's what's the difference? H three twenty three is H twenty three. What's what's the difference if it's voice or video? I mean, wh why would you why would you allow video conferences across the border, but not allow H three twenty three voice across the border? I agree. I agree. <laughs> yes. I asked for Cofetel because we have a voice over IP over on all our campuses. When you make bypass is when you connect to private network with a public service? Is it the answer that they give it to me? But it depends who it is. Now, that could be a very loose 
but you see too, I, one of the bullets on there was to get the group to sit down and put together an international policy for voice over IP because that's not an easy subject. Um, Australia interprets it one way, Mexico interprets it another way, the United States interprets it another way. So um, that's, that's not a simple one. I think it'll be a lot like they're talking about in the United States. They don't know how to regulate it, so what they're going to do is just ignore it until the volume gets significant, then they're going to tax it, okay? Thank you very much. Uh, I've got some of my cards here. If you do want to participate in the, in, in the project, let me know. We really, really want to... I don't want to come here next time and say, let's do this, okay? Because I have that problem with the other, with the U.S. Internet 2 group. We keep going from meeting to meeting saying, this is what we need to do. So, uh, okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Bueno, este... Vamos a continuar la, las pláticas... Carlos, si nos dejas continuar, no me enojo. Ok, la siguiente plática eh, la van a dar Javier Cano y Mónica Aletia, Aletia, de la Universidad de Veracruzana. Y siguiendo con el mismo tema, telefonía IP, la comunicación del futuro. Les pido un aplauso para... Les dejo el foro. Buenas tardes. Nosotros venimos en representación de la Universidad Veracruzana, el ingeniero Javier Cano, Mónica Sánchez, para dar la, de la plática de telefonía sobre IP de nuestro proyecto que está en proceso de desarrollo. Bueno, después de lo que escuchamos, pues esto se les va a parecer muy poquito. Yo creo que, como dijo el, el anterior ponente, eh, esperemos que esto crezca. Eh, la idea es que seamos una de las primeras universidades que le entremos al proyecto. Como dijo él, espero que pues, para la próxima ponencia del CUDI estemos adentro. Comencemos. Primero, las definiciones. Voz sobre IP no es más que la transmisión de voz sin ningún otro contenido. Eso lo hacen en Meeting, eso lo hace Yahoo. Muchos, muchos programas comerciales gratis lo están haciendo. Nosotros queremos eh, transmitir a través de IP telefonía. Eso implica identificación de llamadas, eh, todos los servicios, conferencia, transferencia. El propósito del proyecto va más allá de lo que les comentaba, la pura transmisión de voz. Queremos integrar todos los servicios telefónicos a través de nuestra red IP. Sí. La Universidad de Jalapa es una universidad muy extensa en lo que es el territorio. O sea, tiene muchas dependencias en todo el estado. Pero principalmente tenemos la unidad central en Jalapa vicerrectorías en la zona de Poza Rica, Tuxpan, Veracruz, Córdoba Orizaba y Coaxacualcos Minatitlán. La siguiente. Inicialmente teníamos 
este esquema de, para nuestra voz tenemos un PBX Meridian en la unidad central en cada una de las regiones teníamos multilíneas Nordstar pequeños 0x32 nuestro enlace se hacía a través de multiplexores clásico en esa época y para las demás dependencias tenemos conmutadores pequeños del tipo de Panasonic o algunas dependencias en forma directa a través de la red pública bueno desde hace un par de años iniciamos el crecimiento de la red IP de la universidad comenzó con fibra óptica, switches de alta velocidad actualmente hay más de 10.000 nodos en la red todos ellos con la posibilidad de ser una extensión más de nuestro computador entregarles servicios de telefonía nosotros eh, al momento de hacer nuestro análisis pensamos en usar computadores híbridos aunque no fueran puramente IP por los costos y porque la gente ya está acostumbrada al sistema de teléfono tradicional nuestros PBX usan teléfonos convencionales usarían teléfonos IP hardphone y teléfonos softphone en la computadora la justificación económica se la dejo aquí bueno, sabemos que debemos aprovechar los recursos tecnológicos que nos brinda la red de datos de la universidad pero también debemos aprovechar y básicamente es uno de los principales objetivos que es que pues es tener ciertos ahorros en la economía de, de la institución. En este caso, nosotros lo que queremos hacer en la justificación económica, queremos que todas las dependencias fuera de la unidad central, cuente con, que cuente con un enlace de datos, podrán acceder a la red de voz de la universidad. Esto lo que implica una disminución en el costo de servicio medido y sobre todo de la larga distancia. Además, se utilizará únicamente el enlace directo del proveedor de larga distancia en el PBX de que se encuentra ubicado en la unidad central que es Jalapa. ¿Cuáles son nuestros objetivos principales? Los objetivos que nosotros tenemos van a ser eliminar las llamadas de larga distancia entre la unidad central y las regiones, es decir, la comunicación interna de larga distancia que se venía presentando se va a eliminar en casi su totalidad requerimos para esto vamos a hacer más transparente la comunicación por lo que vamos a unificar la marcación en las regiones podemos acceder remotamente a los servicios telefónicos de la universidad en base, a través de los enlaces de datos es decir, vamos a utilizar softphone para poder comunicarnos remotamente también qué es lo que vamos a hacer bueno, nos va a permitir también controlar el uso del servicio de larga distancia porque se va a tarificar en la unidad central todos los servicios que se quieran realizar para hablar externos a nuestra red interna de telefonía y también se va a unificar lo que es la plataforma tecnológica solamente vamos a contar con equipo de un proveedor en especial en este caso de Avaya Bueno, iniciamos una primera etapa hace un año Instalamos un PBX en la región de Veracruz con 30 extensiones IP y 24 extensiones remotas. Remotas significa que no son eh, puramente IP, sino que son digitales que se conectan a un equipo que me hace, el, eh, me hace el enlace por vía IP. Interconectamos el PBX del equipo remoto con la unidad central, distribuimos esas extensiones digitales entre las direcciones y jefaturas de la unidad central que es a donde más habla la, el personal y validamos la operación la situación actual está así seguimos teniendo el equipo de Nortel tenemos un equipo remoto, un MAX 3000 que se conecta vía IP al Definity ProLogix que tenemos en Veracruz él me entrega 24 extensiones, de las cuales 22 son digitales, dos extensiones analógicas que estoy metiendo a mi equipo Nortel y eh, nos dieron de prueba un par de, de troncales analógicas para este equipo remoto que también conecto al equipo Nortel. Eso me permite llamar desde, también, desde cualquier teléfono 
ya sea analógico o digital de Nortel hacia cualquier teléfono del equipo ProLogix y viceversa yo de cualquier teléfono del equipo ProLogix puedo marcar a mis extensiones del Nortel desgraciadamente pues nada más tenemos dos en este momento dos troncales y están, casi siempre están saturadas también de este equipo yo puedo colgar un soft phone a través de la red de la universidad un hard phone también en la misma red de hecho en cada una de las regiones hay hard phones eh, para los secretarios académicos el secret los secretarios de finanzas y los vicerrectores que puedan comunicarse fácilmente hacia la unidad central también a través del internet podemos conectar el soft phone de hecho en casa de ustedes en un momento dado cuando necesito hablar tengo un enlace a internet con Prodigy me conecto y puedo hablar a cualquier parte de la universidad ¿Sí? la parte económica se la dejo a Mónica bueno aquí como como podemos notar en la tabla eh, con apenas algunas extensiones IP que tenemos que son 30 y 24 extensiones remotas nosotros hemos obtenido considerables ahorros esto estamos hablando del primer semestre del año 2002 que es cuando empezamos a operar ¿sí? como vemos los consumos del 2001 en el mismo primer semestre tenemos que era un total de cerca de 600 mil pesos y con, el, con la instalación de las extensiones IP logramos un consumo de, de ahorrar 417 mil pesos ¿Qué es lo que pasó con esto? Se nos redujo considerablemente el servicio de larga distancia ¿sí? y por lo tanto tenemos ahorita un ahorro anual estimado de 360 mil pesos aproximadamente. Actualmente seguimos trabajando en ello. Estamos por instalar un PBX similar a la unidad central, de hecho me llegó el equipo justo antes de venir a esta reunión. Con eso vamos a centralizar todos los servicios administrativos, lo que es el correo de voz, la tarificación, la administración en sí, de todo el sistema de telefonía en la unidad central, en Jalapa. Con eso pretendemos interconectar todas las dependencias de las regiones a la red de telefonía IP de la universidad este es el proyecto final cómo va a quedar estimamos, estimamos terminar en enero vamos a tener PBX a Valla en rectoría otro PBX en cada una de las regiones igual a Valla vamos a interconectarlos a través de ISDN IP 